Good morning, Central Baptist Church family. We are so excited to worship together this morning. I invite you to stand with us. Let's sing praises to the Lord. Let's sing, Come Thou Fount. Come Thou Fount of every blessing To my heart to sing Thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure, safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from death. Interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. What a wonderful hymn to gather and sing together as God's people. And I pray that all of us would say, here's my heart, Lord. May I live completely for you. Welcome to Central Baptist Church. I'm so glad that you have taken some time to gather around your televisions or your computer screens and worship with us. Don't forget, you can go online and you can still send in prayer requests so that we can get to know more about you and pray specifically for the needs that you have going on in your life. And don't forget, you can also like and comment on the different platforms that you may be watching this on. We'd love to get to know how many of you are watching. Don't forget, the governor this week did say something about churches starting to gather together. We want to take our time, though, and make sure we're doing it right. We don't want to put anyone's lives or health at risk. And so just wait, continue to be patient, tune into our uh, website, and just look for information. We'll make sure we communicate well with you when it's time and how we're going to start getting back together. Would you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have and that you've given us the technology that we can still gather around the Word of God as Central Baptist Church. We pray today, continue to pray for our worship team as Clint leads us in song, for Scott as he breaks open God's Word for us, Lord, that we would be ready to hear what you are telling us through the Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord, that you never forsake us, you never leave us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship through song. Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change. Thank you, Lord. One thing remains. One thing remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. And on and on. And on and on. His love is never-ending, 
His love is never failing. We thank you, Lord, for that. The sun comes up It's a new day dawning It's time to sing Your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing When the evening comes Bless the Lord, O my soul Thank you. Thank you for the promise that 
even when our, our life draws near on this earth. We know that it's just the beginning mm-hmm. of being able to worship you in your glory. Lord, what a day mm. that will be knowing that this is our temporary home, Lord. That's right. And that we will see you face to face. What a day that will be. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. We are challenged uh, here by Paul that if we have been changed, if our hearts have been changed, then we should seek those things that are different. Seek those things that are Christ-like. Put our minds on what is above, not earthly things. Put our minds on things that are of God, that are Christ-like. Because Jesus is ours. He has died on the cross for our sins. And because of that, we in turn now should live in a Christ-like manner. So let's continue to sing worship to our Lord and Savior. Fade each earthly joy, Jesus is mine. Stronger than fleeting hopes, Jesus is mine. Dark is the wilderness, earth has no resting place. Jesus alone can bless, Jesus is mine. In days of fragile peace, Jesus is mine. Fearful nights of grief, Jesus is mine. His voice commands the storm, His presence stills my soul. He will sustain my hope, Jesus is mine. Jesus is mine, Jesus is mine, when all else fails, He still remains, Jesus is mine, when on that fire, Jesus is mine. Before his radiant face, Jesus is mine. Safe in his arms I'll cling, praising my Savior King. Forevermore I'll sing. Jesus is mine, Jesus is mine, Jesus is mine, when all else fails, He still remains, Jesus is mine. Let's sing that together just our voices.
Jesus is mine. Jesus is mine. When all else fails, he still remains. Jesus is Let me invite you to take your copy of God's Word and open with me to Mark chapter 9. We're back there this week. I appreciate Mark preaching last week. This week we're going to be back in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9 verses 14 through 29. I'm fortunate to work close enough to my house that I can go home for lunch. I often go home and, uh, and watch a TV show, watch ESPN or something like that while I'm at home. And a few weeks back I was home and, and I went into the living room and there was a glare on the TV. And so I closed the blinds to get rid of that glare, sat back down to enjoy my lunch, and couldn't help but notice out of the corner of my eye a little dot of light on the wall. You think, what's so significant about that? Well, even with everything I had done to close out the light, the light found a way to get through. And there's a lesson in that for us, and it applies directly to our passage today. That sometimes our faith is like that little hole in the blinds that allowed the sunlight to get through. Compared to everything else, sometimes our faith seems so small, so insignificant, so fledgling, almost not even there. It's, it's as if our faith is gone. We're battling to believe, yet God's mercy and His grace are so incredibly glorious that they find a way through. And all it takes is just a shred, a sliver of belief. And that's what we see in our passage today. Last time we were together in the Gospel of Mark, we saw Peter and James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus was transfigured there before him. Before them, they, they saw him, they described him as his face was so white, so bright that it was like the sun, Matthew said. Luke described his clothing as bright as lightning. And Mark, when he came to describe the, the clothing of, of Jesus, he said it was like no one on, on earth could, could bleach. It was that white. And now they come down off the mountain, they come back into the valley, and as they come down, they return to find conflict. There's a desperate father who had brought his demon-possessed son, hoping to find Jesus so that he could make a last-ditch effort to have Jesus cast the demon out. Jesus wasn't there. Jesus had been on the mountain. And so in Jesus' absence, the disciples decided to try and step up. After all, Jesus had previously commissioned them, sent them out, and they had done this before. They had, they had cast out demons and so they tried. They tried to cast the demon out of the little boy, but they had failed. They couldn't. They didn't understand why, but they couldn't. And in the mind of the father, he was at the point of despair. Every bit of the light of hope that he had in bringing his son to Jesus had gone dark. It had been extinguished, and he was swallowed up in this dark despair. Jesus encounters him as he comes back down the mountain, as we'll read in our passage, and, and he encourages the man to believe. that he, he, Jesus told him all things are possible for the one who would believe. And his reply was, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. The reason I started out by telling you the story I did about the little dot of sunlight on the wall of the living room is that just as that sunlight found its way through that tiny hole, as I tried to watch TV that day, the glorious light of God's wonder-working power, we'll see, will find its way through the tiniest sliver of faith as this man struggles to believe. Follow along with me as I read Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with him. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. 
And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I ask your disciples to, ca- to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything... Have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And we had, when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to open our eyes to, to see and our ears to understand his word this morning. Let's pray. Father, we need desperately to hear from you. Father, I know that even now there are those who are watching this message who struggle with with doubt, struggling with faith that, that wants to believe but is just assaulted constantly by by questions and 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 they lack anything of assurance and father i pray that you today would take your word and that god that you would open it to our eyes that you would help us to see it help us to hear it and father that today you might use your word the spirit of god might apply the word of god and that you might give assurance to the one who doubts today i pray this in jesus name amen The first thing we see in our passage today is that the devil aims to destroy you. This is always the devil's aim. He aims to destroy you. In verses 17 through 18, someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. Now, I'm an Andy Griffith fan. Maybe some of you are Andy Griffith show fans as well. And there's an episode where a new boy comes to town and Opie makes a friend. And the new kid is is from the city and and he's from a rather wealthy family. And he convinces Opie that that the thing going that that parents all know is that they don't, kids don't have to work for an allowance. And so Opie decides that he doesn't want to do this either. So he goes in and and he throws a tantrum in front of his father because he wants to get an allowance without having to work for it. That's not what's going on here. This is not some temper tantrum. This is not some kid that's just spoiled and and wanting to take advantage of, of his father's gullibility. Instead, this boy, Mark makes clear, has a demon. His symptoms mimic epilepsy. But Mark makes it clear that this is no disease, this is no tantrum, but instead, this is a boy who has an evil spirit that makes him mute. We see here the devil trying to destroy him. We, we see the devil's actions in this boy. These actions were erratic. It, the father says, and, and whenever it attacks him, whenever it seizes him. And the word, word whenever is filled with meaning. There's no certainty there. They never knew when it was going to come on. They never knew what was going to bring it on. It was erratic. They never knew when the demon was going to take possession of the boy. It was often violent. The devil used violent action. It says there that it threw him down. This was no 
action of the, the boy. The boy wasn't doing this. Instead, he was being tossed around like a rag doll by this demon. It was happening repeatedly. It was also traumatic. He was foaming and grinding his teeth and becoming rigid. You can imagine a father standing back and watching this happen to his son and how traumatic this must have been. In verses 20 through 22, they brought, to the, they brought the boy to Jesus. And when the Spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. He fell on the ground. He rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It's often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. That's the phrase there from where I get this point. The devil had meant to, uh, through sending one of these demons to take possession of this boy, was out to destroy him. We, we see here the evil nature, the unclean nature of the demon. That as soon as they bring the boy to Jesus and the demon sees Jesus, immediately the the unclean, the evilness revolts. It, it backs up from the holiness that is God. And Jesus was so utterly holy that it said when the Spirit saw Jesus, it convulsed the boy. The devil's actions there, the demon's actions in the boy were also chronic from childhood, we're told. It's also murderous. They, he often tried to throw the boy into fire or into water to destroy him meaning to kill him. Imagine the, after years and years of this going on, the, the scarring and the disfigurement that must have marked this boy. The devil aims to destroy you. Your encounter may not be the same as this little boy, which I hope not, and most of us will never encounter anything like this, but don't ever let that lull you into a place where you think that somehow the devil's aim toward you has changed because the devil always aims to destroy. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter warned there to be watchful because our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it tells us that the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Not from the beginning of his creation, but at the point of his rebellion against God, from, from really the sort of beginning of time, we see him come into the garden to Eve in the form of the serpent. He's been sinning from the beginning of what we know of human history. He's the originator of sin. In Genesis 3 and in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, it tells us that, that he's the one who came in the form of the serpent and deceived Eve. John 8, Jesus talked about Satan being a murderer, that he was a murderer from the beginning, that he was a liar and he was the father of lies. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, just as Satan tempted Eve, he even tried to tempt Jesus, the Son of God. There are no lines that are uncrossable with him. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it calls Satan the deceiver of the whole world. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, we, we learn that he has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the beauty of the gospel in the glory of Christ. In Galatians 4, verse 8, we're told that Satan and his demonic army keep people enslaved to the things that keep them from turning to God. Satan and demons use temptation, doubt, guilt, fear, confusion, sickness, envy, pride, and slander. All of those things they use to, to hinder the witness of the Christian, but ultimately to seek to destroy them. Now, I'm reminded that just as Peter in 1 Peter 5 verse 8 uh, talked about being on the watch for this enemy, the adversary, who was roaming around like a roaring lion. But he started that, that epistle with the promise that we would be kept. And he wants them to know that, that even though Satan tries to destroy the believer, that he can't, but he's going to do everything he can to hinder you. But I want, think it's worth us noting today that even though this is a heavy topic, and even though this is something that most of the world today would say, 
we've grown past that. We are enlightened. It's, we, we're rational people. We don't believe in demons anymore. The Bible still does. Jesus did. There's no reason to think that demons don't exist, and therefore we must be beware that He aims to destroy us. Which brings us to the second point that we see in our passage, that while the devil aims to destroy you, that your natural strength, my natural strength, is insufficient to stop him. And you say, well, pastor, I thought this sermon was supposed to be good news, supposed to be encouraging for me. How am I supposed to be encouraged? All you've told me so far is the devil's trying to destroy me, and in my natural strength, I have I'm no match for him. Well, we're getting there. Just don't check out. The boy's father was powerless. He must have felt hopeless. I mean, think about it from, from childhood. Now, we don't know how old the boy is, but from childhood, we're, we're made to, to think that, that years have gone by, that he's been struggling with, been possessed with this demon, and the father has had to watch over and over again. The father says, often it has thrown him into fire. Often it has thrown him into water to destroy him. Imagine the, the heartbreak <coughs> and the struggle that he must have felt uh, just watching his son suffer this way. Don't you think that the father would have stopped this if he could? I mean, that's what dads do. They protect their kids. If, if the father could have, he certainly would have, would have protected his own son. But he was powerless to do anything about it. How long had he watched in agony as his son was tormented? The father may, may not have even known that his son was deaf. In verse 17, he, he brings him to Jesus and he says, He has a spirit that makes him mute. But when Jesus talks to the demon later on, he calls him this deaf and mute spirit. spirit. So perhaps the father knew that he, couldn't, he wasn't talking to him, but maybe he didn't even know the reason he wasn't talking was because he couldn't hear the father speak. The father was powerless. The disciples here in our passage, their natural strength wasn't enough either. The disciples had, had tried to cast out the demon, but they had indeed failed. In verse 18, it, we're, we're told that, that the father brings the son and he brings him to the disciples to cast it out, but they weren't able. The disciples must have thought, why, why not? Why? In fact, we know that because they asked Jesus later on, why couldn't we cast it out? I mean, they had been able to before. In chapter 6, verse 13, we're, we're told that they cast out many demons when Jesus sent them out. So I would imagine that when Jesus wasn't there and this man showed up with his son, they must have thought, we've done this before, we know how to do this. But they found out that they couldn't this time. And they didn't know why. Verses 14 through 16, when, when Jesus, Peter, James, and John came back from the mountain of transfiguration, they came down to the disciples and they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes were arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw Jesus, they were greatly amazed. They ran up to him and they greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? This is what Jesus walks back into. I can imagine, oh, the embarrassment that the disciples must have encountered when they stepped up to cast out this demon from this little boy or, or this teenager. We don't know how old. Oh, the embarrassment in front of the entire crowd when they failed. And just then they look up and they see not just the crowd, but now they see their rabbi. They see the teacher, the one that Peter said was the Messiah coming. And they must have felt shame, failure, that, that they had failed in what Jesus had sent them out to do. And there were the scribes, the religious leaders, there just to rub it in if that weren't enough. Sometimes, for reasons unknown to us, Satan is given more leeway. He's allowed to, to have a little more leash, and he's allowed to, to be able to do a lot more than, in, in some cases, what he normally would do. There will occasionally be things in our lives that we will encounter that we are powerless to stop. Just as the father was powerless to protect his son, and the disciples were powerless to deliver this boy, there will be times where 
the leeway given to Satan will affect us in such a way that we're powerless. We can't do anything about it. You would do anything to, to deliver yourself or to deliver your loved one, but nothing works. And the power of addiction to some sort of drug or alcohol or pornography or food or, 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 or something else. Or, or maybe you would stop the abuse if you could, but there's a, there's a husband or a dad or someone else in there that you can't break through. Perhaps it's something like cancer or Alzheimer's or something like that. And you would do anything you could to, to rescue your loved one, but in the middle of it, you're powerless against it. There are some things that you and I need to know when we come up against this. When, when our natural strength is insufficient to stop the work of Satan against us. One is that not all suffering is demonic activity. Some of it is just the, 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 the ramifications of the fall. We live in a fallen, broken world where, where Adam and Eve sin, and we follow suit in that. And the world around us is broken, and sometimes things go wrong that we're powerless against. We're living in the midst of one of those things right now. With the coronavirus and the pandemic and the, the quarantine that we're all experiencing, we can't do anything about that, and, and I don't know that I would say that it's necessarily demonic activity as much as it is. This is part of living in a broken world, and this is what happens when we live here. But, but secondly, not all suffering is demonic activity, but secondly, God is never powerless. Matthew 28, verse 18 says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He goes on from there and he commissioned, he gives the great commission. But prior to sending them out and prior to sending us out, it's important that we know all authority belongs to him. That there is none greater than him. He is powerless against no one. He is all powerful. In Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11 tells us, that God has highly exalted him, meaning Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, there's no power, there's no end to the power of God. Former church I was at, there was a little boy when I first got there who would come up to me with his, with his grandfather after the service. And he wanted me to, to pick him up and to throw him in the air. I made the mistake of doing this one Sunday when he was there. I picked him up and I threw him up in the air with his grandfather's blessing, by the way. And, uh, and then every Sunday after that, he would come to me and want me to pick him up and throw him in the air. Well, he did this for weeks and months and years until finally, I had to look at him and say, I can't do that anymore. There was a limit to my power, to my strength, because he had grown. And I could no longer pick up the child that once I could toss very easily into the air, I could no longer do that. But that will never be the case with God. There's never going to be something that outgrows the strength of our God because he is never powerless. The third thing we need to know not only is all suffering not always the, the demonic activity, and God is never without power. He's, he's always powerful. But third, God gives us His power. He gives it to us. He says, my strength is your strength. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-4 through 4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. Divine power. God power. That's the strength that we have. 1 John 4, 4. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Well, who's in the world? Well, Satan's in the world. The demonic army is in the world. But greater is he who is in us. Who's in us? Well, for the believer, the one who is in us is the Spirit of, of Christ Himself. We have God's power residing within us. And Paul's prayer for the Ephesians in chapter 1, verses 19 through 21 said, that he prayed that they would know the immeasurable greatness of His power toward them. 
who, the, toward those who believe. According to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ, when He raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, <coughs> and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. The power that raised Christ from the dead is ours. The power that is over every other power is ours because we are in Christ. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, we have power to conquer Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. You see, the devil's aim is to destroy us And in our own natural strength, we were insufficient to stop him. But we have more as followers of Christ. We have more than natural strength. We have God's strength given to us to resist. Everything we need for life and godliness is ours in Christ Jesus. Which brings us to the third point. When the the devil's aim meets the the limit of your strength, if if you sort of when you lose sight of the fact that we've been given God's strength, when you lose sight of that and when the devil's aim to destroy us comes to the place where it it meets our own weakness, the normal result is doubt. And this is what I think is the crux of the passage today. The third point I would have you to see is that wrestling with doubt is normal, especially when it seems like Satan is winning. In verses 22 through 24, The man said to Jesus, But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Incredibly powerful, encouraging words. But I want you to see something here. Looking at the entire context of the book of Mark, back in chapter 1 of Mark, the question from the leper was a matter of will. When he came to Jesus for help, it wasn't a matter of, 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 um, of, of can, because he knew Jesus could. He had seen it all around. So the leper's question was, since you can, will you? Now we come to... The father of the demon-possessed boy, and the question is reversed. It's not a question of will. It is a question of ability. The question is not since you can, will you? Instead, for the father of the demon-possessed boy, it is since you will, can you? And you say, what's the difference? Why the switch there? Well, the leper had witnessed Jesus' ability, but all the leper knew was the shunning of society. No one would touch the leper. No one wanted to come close to the leper. No one was willing. In fact, the leper had to walk through and and yell out, unclean, unclean. He knew the ability. He had seen Jesus do incredible things for so many other people. But would he be willing to do so for the leper? For him, it wasn't a matter of ability. It was a matter of willingness. But for the boy's father, plenty had tried In fact, the disciples had tried and they had failed. Nobody had been able to help. For him, even though Jesus had helped so many others and so many other people, the father had succumbed to hopelessness and and he was engulfed with doubt. For him, it wasn't a matter of, uh, of, of, of willingness. It was a matter of could he do it? Jesus took offense to the man's to the man's statement. When the man said, if you can do anything, have compassion on us, Jesus rightly takes offense at that, and he sternly rebukes the man. Well, for one thing, because he's God, and God can do all things. There is nothing that's too hard for God. But the other reason that Jesus is offended and rebukes the man is because hadn't at this point Jesus done enough to prove his power? I mean, hadn't he, hadn't he done more than enough to show that he had a power and authority over disease and disaster and demons and even death at this point? I mean, why? Why this sort of question? But then Jesus encouraged the man when he said, All things are possible for the one who believes. 
You see, the father had come to the place where he was so discouraged and he was at the point of such despair that he doubted that even the Son of God could do what his son needed. And he had lost sight of who Jesus was. And Jesus reminded him that all things are possible for God. All things are possible for the one who believes. The Father's reply should resonate with all of us. We've all at times felt like, I know these things are true. I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. His his statement should cause us to, to exhale in relief with, maybe I'm normal. Maybe it's normal for me to have These doubts, not so that we can wallow in unbelief, but so that we can follow the man's example and ask the Lord to help us, to help us in our unbelief. The man said, I believe, help my unbelief. Literally, what it means in the original language was run to my unbelief. Come to my aid. No one else has been able to do this. Run to me, Jesus. Some of you. You're watching this, and some of you wrestle with doubt more than others. Some of you are outright plagued with it. You wonder how in the world you could be saved if you have doubts. In fact, you wonder, am I saved at all? You constantly search for assurance You read things like, these things were written so that you may know that you have eternal life. But you still, it it eludes you and you can't find the assurance that you want. You wait desperately for God to answer. You wait desperately for God to heal. You wait desperately for God to deliver you from your doubts. And and, and I wish I could honestly uh, tell you why some people are more given to doubts than others. But I, I can't tell you that. I don't know. Here's some things I do know. I do know that according to Romans chapter 12, verse 3, that God gives to each one a certain measure of faith that he deems appropriate. So it's not up to us to to argue with God, why didn't you give me more faith? Because God knows what he's doing, even in giving you the level of faith that you have. The second thing I know in this is I know that God saves those who trust him. So whether you struggle to believe or whether it's a settled issue with you, if you believe, if you are counting on Jesus Christ as your only hope of salvation and you have no other options and you're turning to Him, resting solely in Him, even though you doubt, the Bible says on the authority of His Word that He will save you. So you can rest in that. The third thing I know is that You and I can take him at his word, that we should take him at his word, that we should believe what he has said, that when doubts assail us, the the place we should go to is his word, to go to the truth of his word there. The fourth thing I know is that if you still wrestle with doubt, repeat the prayer of this father. Ask him to help you in your unbelief. The fourth thing from our passage, fourth point from our passage today is that even though the devil aims to destroy us, and even though in our own natural strength we are are powerless to stop him, and even though doubts in that place where those two things mesh, doubts are normal, especially when it seems like he's winning. Fourth, Jesus runs to those who need him. He runs to those who need him, no matter how weak you are. Stephen Altrogi in his blog uh, wrote about this, this, this passage, and he said these words, The glorious reality is that it's not the strength of our faith that causes God to answer prayers, but it is the steadfast love of the Lord. And that is a beautiful word. That it, It's not up to us to have the, the, the size of faith. We don't have to muster this up. Instead, it's the steadfast love of the Lord. He is stronger than your greatest foe. He is more willing and able even, than, than, even when your doubts tell you otherwise. He runs to those who need Him. To the Father, He ran to Him, to this Father, this boy. How does Jesus help the Father's unbelief? I mean, this is what the Father asked for, help my unbelief. How does He help Him? 
Well, in verses 25 through 27, we see there he helps them with a powerful word and with a permanent word. Those verses, when Jesus saw that a crowd came together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying and convulsing, it came out of him. The boy was like a corpse, so that so many said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, gave him back to his father. He, he helps the father's unbelief with a powerful word. The powerful word was, come out of him. Jesus did what no one else was able to do with a word. What Satan had tried to do for, for, for all those years, Jesus did with a word. His word is powerful. He uses it both to create and to destroy. In Genesis 1 and 2, we read the creation account where God speaks and the world comes to be. Let there be light. And there was light. We also read in places like Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where it says the the, the Word of God is living and active. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's, it's like a surgeon's scalpel that God can use to, to cut out disease of sin from us. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11 says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. That goes out from my mouth, God says, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that all that that I set it out to to accomplish. It shall it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word is powerful. And this is what Jesus shows the struggling father is in these moments when doubts assail. My word is powerful. Go to my word. Jesus also helps him with a permanent word. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, gives us an example of that. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. I went to that verse because in our passage today, Jesus not not only casts the demon out of this boy, but he instructs the demon, never return to him again. Don't ever come back. Jesus' word is permanent. It cannot fail. With a word, he banishes the demon from this boy. Imagine the, the wholeness that would have happened in that moment. Imagine the, the sweet relief and all of the hope realized when Jesus takes the boy by the hand and gives him to his father. For years, the father had hurt for his son, and now he has his son whole. That can be found in the powerful and permanent word of God. If you want to be delivered from the doubts that assail you, if you want to be delivered from the fears, the anxiety, all of that thing, I'm not saying that it will happen overnight necessarily, but I would encourage you to go to God's Word because in God's Word you will find a power and a permanence that nothing in this world can provide. That's why 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us that the Word of God is is breathed out by Him, is perfect. It is useful for teaching, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You will find hope in the Word. But secondly, Jesus runs not only to the Father, but He runs to the disciples. The disciples are standing there. They're embarrassed in front of the crowd. They feel like failures in front of their their Master. And the scribes are just rubbing it in. And Jesus runs to them. They have this private conversation with Jesus after the fact, and they say to him, why why couldn't we cast it out, Jesus? And Jesus said to them, this kind cannot be be driven out by anything but prayer. Which begs us to to the question, this kind? What's up with that? This kind? What does that mean? Does that mean there are different kinds? There are some demons that are more stubborn than others? Well, Scripture would lead us to, to, to realize that there are differences there, but we don't have time to go there. Not in this sermon. We don't have time to go there. And not only that, but that would be missing the entire point. That's not the point of our passage. 
You say, well, what is the point, Pastor? What's, what's the point of Jesus telling the disciples this kind can't be driven out by anything but prayer? Well, what Jesus is doing, remember, in the disciples is he's turning away from public ministry and he's turning toward his disciples and he's teaching them. He's preparing them for when he would leave. And when he leaves, they need to know that even in his absence, they can trust him. And that's precisely one of the purposes of prayer. You pray because you've come to the end of yourself and you need God to do what only God can do. That's what we do in prayer. We come before God and we say, God, in this situation, in this issue, in this circumstance, Lord, I can't, but you can. Glorify yourself by doing it. Do what only you can do. And in that moment, we are trusting, we are relying on God, and God is glorified when we rely on Him. Al Mohler, in a sermon on this passage, said these words. He said, God has ordained prayer as a means by which we receive grace. We should not be surprised if those who rob themselves of such means of grace know in their lives a deficit of faith. If you live a prayerless life, if you live a wordless life, not going to the Word of God, I can assure you that your faith will suffer. You will struggle there. You will struggle to believe. Hear the words of Jesus. This kind comes out only by prayer, by trusting in the Lord, by calling out to Him. In our passage today, we've seen that the devil aims to destroy you. We've seen that your and our natural strength is insufficient to stop him. We've seen that when those, those things come into to meeting one another, that it's natural and normal for us to doubt, that every believer at times wrestles with some sort of doubt. But ultimately, the thing that I don't want you to miss is that Jesus runs to those who need him. That's what we see in the cross. Jesus left all of heaven and came to where we were because we couldn't, and only He could. He lived the life that you and I should have lived, and He died the death that was meant for for us, so that if we would place our faith in Him, turning from sin and trusting in Him, that He would forgive us our, our sins, that He would take our punishment in our place, and that one day when He returns, that we would be with Him forever. I don't know where you are today, friend, but if today you don't know Him as Savior, can I just invite you to turn from trusting in yourself, to turn from, from wondering about your doubts and your anxiety and fear and all those things, and can I just invite you to place your trust in Jesus Christ? He died to save you. Would you trust Him? Turn from yourself and place your faith in Him. Today, if, if you're watching this and, and you are a believer, you know you're a Christian, but there are times when you wrestle with, you struggle with doubt, you struggle with, with wondering about this issue or that issue or how long, Lord, will you allow this to go on? I would just encourage you to maybe renew your commitment to be in God's Word every day, to cast your cares on Him, to pray, to be constant in prayer. Whatever it is the Lord is leading you to today, I would just encourage you to right where you are, in your living room, in your office, watching this on a computer somewhere, whatever the case, wherever you are, I would encourage you to respond favorably to however the Lord leads you. And if you do so, if you respond in some action of faith, we would love to hear about it. There's going to be a slide on the screen. You can email us at the church office, call the church office. We would love to know so that we can help you to walk forward in your decision of faith. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you run to those who need you. Father, we have a great enemy, but he is no match for you. And Father, we take great joy in that. And I pray, Father, that right now for those that that are living in the midst of doubt, Lord, would you set them free? Would you speak... Your word, God, would you allow them to find out who they are according to Christ Jesus? Father, I pray that you would settle that issue, that you would give assurance today. Father, for those of us who who are yours, Father, we cannot say thank you enough. But Father, I pray that you would deliver us from this 
attitude that once we've prayed a prayer, that following you is doesn't require anything else of us. Father, I pray that we would seek you, that we would pursue you, that we would delight to be in your presence. Father, would you do everything you want to do through the preaching of your word. God, glorify yourself in it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. sing that chorus one more time, just the voices.
Lord God, we thank you that your grace is greater than our sin. Lord, what a blessing that is. I pray that we never take that for granted, Lord. What a phrase, grace that is greater than our sin. Lord, we thank you for that grace. We thank you for the new mercies that come with each new morning. God, I ask that you be with us. Help us reflect Christ as we go about our days today. Lord, help us show that grace to others. As you have bestowed it on us, Lord, I pray that we would show grace to others just as you have towards us. We thank you. We love you. We praise you today. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us this week, and I hope that you were truly blessed as we sang praises together and heard God's word together. Let's go out this week and make sure that we are the light of Christ and the salt in this community so that more and more people can hear the gospel. Don't forget that you can still give, even though we're not able to gather together. You can give online, you can text and give, you can come in in person and drop it off in the offering boxes. But we are so appreciative to all of you who have faithfully given given during this time that we can't be together. Thank you so much. Have a great week and God bless you. never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me, and on and on and on and on it goes, yes it overwhelms and satisfies my soul, and I never ever have to be afraid, this one Never runs out on me. You love-